La dernière intervenante, mais non la moindre, est Sarah Ma. Euh, Sarah est une jeune femme qui vient de Vancouver, qui étudie maintenant à Montréal, qui apprend le français. <rire> Euh, et qui euh, étudie euh, à McGill, en fait, elle est en train de faire son doctorat en épidémiologie. Elle est euh, d'une troisième génération d'une famille euh, de Canado, non, sino canadiens euh, et elle, a été, elle est née et euh, elle a été élevée à Vancouver. Euh, elle a aussi été, son activisme féminisme a commencé en tant que travailleuse de première ligne, si on peut dire, dans un centre contre les agressions sexuelles, une, ma une maison d'hébergement qui s'appelle le Vancouver Rape Relief, avec qui nous sommes en solidarité et en action à différents niveaux. Et elle continue depuis quelques années son travail comme membre du Asian Women Coalition Ending Prostitution, qui est un groupe avec lequel la clé euh, et la Coalition des femmes pour l'abolition de la prostitution a travaillé dans le cadre des, euh, de la cause appelée Bedford, qui a amené à euh, l'adoption d'une nouvelle perspective sur la prostitution au Canada. Et euh, ça me fait plaisir de vous présenter Sarah Ma. So I'm, I'm going to work off a little bit from Jean's really great um, overarching um, presentation about the state of prostitution and trafficking uh, globally and sort of bring it back to a Canadian context of Asian women and prostitution. So we know that prostitution and trafficking in Asian women has become a worldwide phenomenon. Um, with the overwhelming effects of globalization, capitalism, and the economic policies of the global north. And my group, we work on this because we, as we ourselves, we have a, a major stake in it. Um, so the Asian Women Coalition Ending Prostitution, we're a feminist group based in Vancouver, and we join Asian women and women's groups from around the world um, who are organizing to challenge the promotion and normalization of prostitution. So in order for me to give you an idea of what the state of prostitution is here for Asian women in Canada, I need to give you a bit of context um, because we need to be able to locate where the sexualized racism is rooted in history. That myth of the Asian woman, whether she's meek and subservient or exotic and hypersexual, it comes from the conquest based on sex and race and from the history of Western imperialism. We know about the greed and the desire for control of accumula an accumulation of wealth on the part of, of North America, um, the imperialist aggression that's required to take over another country's political and economic autonomy, their natural resources, and their property. We know that war and militarization and global trade continue to be some of the tactics used by imperialist nations to secure natural resources. Now, complicit with these tactics is men's conquest of women in those countries, women being so key to influencing the labor force, the economy, and the culture. Legal scholar Sunny Wong calls it white sexual imperialism, the social inequality that came out of the history between white men and racialized women, women who come from a culture colonized by the West. Sexual conquest served all aspects and tactics of imperialism, and particularly those of the military. We've seen prostitution and trafficking where there is military presence, fueled in part by this common sense notion that prostitution and soldiers go hand in hand. Men fight in battle, women are there to nurse and comfort the men. Between 1932 and 1945, at least 200,000 women from Japanese colonies throughout Asia were trafficked and recruited by the government to provide Japanese soldiers with comfort in the form of military-run brothels. During the Vietnam War, military bases in Thailand served what they called rest and recreation, R&R centers for US soldiers. This was also the Philippine experience with the US military bases in the 80s. And as Jean had mentioned, they're trying to regain some of that control using the visiting forces agreements. But the social imbalance that had been set up 
between white men and Asian women has had lasting impacts that follow us outside of Asia and uh, last much, uh, much longer beyond when, when wars are, are gone. For instance, Thailand's economy is largely based on a, on a sex industry that was established during the war. Um, and, and here's where I want to come to an example of Asian Canadian history. In the 1800s, the demand for cheap labor to build the railroads prompted Canada and the US to allow and encourage the immigration of Chinese and Japanese men for this dangerous work. In 1882, Canada's Prime Minister John A. Macdonald had said, quote, at present, this is simply a question of alternatives. You must either have this Chinese labor or you cannot have the railway. And yet the widespread sentiment of the Chinese was that they were semi-barbaric, an inferior race, people that were sneaky and would swindle the white people out of their livelihoods. When the railroad was done, there was no more need for cheap Asian labor. And so what happened was that they set up exclusionary immigration policies um, in order to halt the expansion and settlement of Chinese families. Um, what they did was they set up a race-based tax called the head tax. Um, and they also would deport um, uh, people and had uh, Im an immigration ban that lasted all the way up to the 50s. Many of the men were isolated from their families and their communities, and many were further relegated to unskilled labor and to domestic work. Before long, the, what we know as the Asian massage parlor, and this was originally set up for the comforts of that lonely Chinese bachelor, became as common a fixture in Chinatowns across North America as the neighboring Chinese restaurant, the laundromat, and the gambling hall. But we still face this legacy of this, this one example um, in our everyday lives of, of, of sexual imperialism and, and white sexual imperialism in mainstream media, in pornography, and in the sex trade. The exact historical conditions that allowed Asian massage parlors to become established and to thrive may have differed from place to place and from time to time, but the fact of the matter is, is that Asian massage parlors persist in just about every major city across North America. From a local perspective, uh, my hometown Vancouver, we know that Vancouver is a hub for organized crime and trafficking in women. Um, including Asian women and domestic, domestic trafficking in Aboriginal women. It's a port city, um, and it also has a relatively large Asian population. But I know that the brothels and the Asian massage parlors that we see at home, it's just a cross-section of what's happening all over North America. Vancouver's not unique in that sense. Um, they're embedded in neighborhoods across major cities in Canada and the US. They're very normal in, in, the, in the landscape. Exposing some of the racist sexism of this industry and providing a feminist analysis of it has been one of our major areas of work as the Asian Women Coalition. Our focus has been on the advertising, um, both online and in print, but these are common, again, to every major city. And we're just using Vancouver as the example. Consistently, Asian women are disproportionately featured in these ads, and you should know that these papers profit on adult service listings alone by as much as $75,000 per week. When we examined the erotic ads online, we saw that about 1,400 ads come out over 24 hours, and this hasn't changed for the last few years. You could say that in some sense, a woman goes on sale every minute. Um, another one of our major findings was that over half of the advertisements marketed Asian women, and in most cases um, would market um, the word Asian or a specific Asian race um, to use that as a selling factor. Um, the most popular words, um, some of the most popular words are submissive, exotic, newly immigrated, uh, fresh off the boat, young and inexperienced. This, and these are just a sample of some of the advertisements and a glimpse into the pornography that shapes men's experience uh, men's expectations of women and reinforce those old racist ideas, those old imperialist notions of the white man that goes to the Orient to conquer the women. Now consider your own neighborhood shopping area. You will likely see that massage parlors are very ordinary in the landscape. And many of these establishments, you should know, are licensed as legitimate businesses, 
such as health centers, massage centers. You can see the sheer density of them in the urban areas of Vancouver. We were able to generate this map with Google Maps. This was a number of years ago. And the ones flagged in red specifically marketed Asian women. I also know that Leclay has take, generated a, a similar map of brothels for, for Montreal, so that's worth looking into their, into their research as well. Now here's a few, just, you can't really, you might not be able to see this, but here's a few descriptions that I pulled off of Montreal's Craigslist last night at the end of the evening. Um, there's almost a thousand remaining ads um, that were posted over a 24 hour period, so it's not that much different um, and you can also see that the ads are, are highly racialized. Um, but these are the stereotypes that are fabricated by the pimps. Um, and, but the, the trouble is, is that the stereotypes, they, they have consequences for all women. Not just women in the sex industry, but women that will never en enter the sex industry. We all get to live with the harassment from men who suffer so-called yellow fever and believe the racist fantasies and insist that we fulfill those stereotypes. Whether that's your husband or your boyfriend, whether he's your coworker or a peer or a boss or, or a John. And then of course there's the very real danger of being recruited into the existing sex, in, sex industry and all those factors that compound that. So um, trafficking, poverty, language barriers, precarious immigration status. We have the living caregiver program in, Can in Canada. Um, the temporary foreign workers program, mail order brides. Th these are the conditions that allow women to, uh, to be funneled into the sex industry. But we're now at a point in history where society is deciding what to make of prostitution and what progress would look like for sexual equality and for racial equality. Um, one of the options we've been given is to re refurbish prostitution as sex work. Uh, it's just another job. Um, a labor rights problem, uh, a, an issue of disease control and of harm reduction, um, condoms, condoms are what you need even though the women don't have any power to, to, uh, any, any power to assert to use those anyway. Um, so for us that's, that's not what progress looks like and it's certainly incompatible with women's equality and with, with, uh, with racial equality. Now the existence of the brothels and the prevalence of the advertising, the overall failure of municipalities to effectively challenge the operation of prostitution businesses have completely normalized male entitlement to women's bodies. And regularizing prostitution does nothing to challenge that entitlement, nor their use of racist narratives for profit. You should know that here in Montreal, we're host to potentially the largest sex trafficking case in Canada involving an estimated 500 women from Asia, uh, mostly from Korea. And th this is all adding to, to, the, to the arena. It, it's adding to the practice and to, the ra to rape culture, um, to the culture of sexual assault, the proliferation of strip clubs in this town, um, to the sexual assault of women on university campuses, um, the reports of sexual assaults in taxi cabs, the absurdity of the police recommendation in Montreal for women to refrain from taking taxis alone. So this all adds to, to the, the culture of violence against women. We argue that we have a right to safety and to bodily integrity and to make real choices that are free of the johns and the pimps and the parasites. And we need this for sustainable, dignified living and meaningful participation in society. We've only begun to imagine and invent alternative futures for women. You know, we've only begun talking about provisions for women in the Nordic model that are so key to advancing women's equality. Exit services and prevention strat strategies, funding to anti-violence feminist groups, universal childcare, education, um, a guaranteed livable income is something we've been talking about more and more. Abolishing prostitution is very much a part of refusing those racist and imperialist and colonialist agendas. The Asian Women Coalition fought for laws to abolish prostitution as a form of sexualized racism. That's the argument that we brought forward to the Supreme Court of Canada. Because our sexual, political, and economic autonomy, it's a fundamental aspect of achieving our sexual and racial equality, and we believe a key component to achieving liberation. So thank you very much.